Okay, so today we present a project um, that we made by, uh, which is a decaffeinating coffee filter, um, which is formed by using molecular imprinting. Um, so why is decaffeination important? Uh, what are some of the side effects of caffeine? Uh, well, caffeine is most likely um, safe for consumption by healthy adults. Uh, there's a large number of side effects uh, that could be harmful to the body. And the most important consideration is that um, the degree of sensitivity towards caffeine is different for, from person to person. And uh, also, so the severity of the side effects can also vary. Um, so uh, even like for healthy adults, um, large doses of caffeine may cause uh, insomnia, nervousness, and restlessness, and also uh, stomach irritation. And so people must have must like carefully monitor their caffeine intake throughout the day in order to you know, avoid some of these side effects. And for people who are more more sensitive to caffeine, um, it can also increase the risk of heart heart disease and high blood pressure, and also increase the amount of ca uh, calcium that's being uh, excreted in the urine, which will accelerate bone loss. And because of all these reasons, caffeine is not re really uh, recommended for intake by children or elderly people. And uh, however, like because ca coffee is the most popular beverage, um, there is still a large uh, population that still that enjoy drinking coffee, and this is where ca decaffeination comes to play. Um, so, a lot of the current methods for decaffeination uh, uses solvent extraction. Uh, which uses organic solvents to dissolve the caffeine from coffee beans. Um, other methods that are used uh, include superfluid, supercritical fluid extraction and active carbon filtering. But the problem with all these methods is that they're not specific for the removal of caffeine. And during this process, like there will be um, considerable loss of flavor compounds. And also these because um, these uh, processes are all limited to the industri industry in factories. Um, they provide like little flexibility for consumers. So one of the most efficient methods of decaffeination right now that's being used is the, called the Swiss water process, which requires um, different batches of uh, coffee beans to be filtered by, acti uh, by, act by active carbon several times to remove the caffeine. Uh, however, this is still like a really complex and lengthy process um, and also doesn't uh, offer any flexibility for consumers. Um, so what are some of the objectives of our project? And our objectives, our objectives are simple uh, based on the um, shortcomings of the current meth methods. Uh, so first is we want to construct a coffee filter that can selectively remove the caffeine from coffee uh, with comparable efficiency to the current methods. And also we want the filter to be able to fit uh, into just like a, any regular coffee maker, um, which provides the maximum conven convenience for the consumer. And lastly, we want the coffee filters to be biodegradable and disposable, and they can be thrown away after a single use like regular coffee filters. Um, so in order to fulfill these requirements and also the requirements of cus uh, customers um, to make a convenient and disposable decaffeinating filters, uh, we implemented several key components in our design. Uh, first of all, we use a method called molecular imprinting uh, to synthesize a polymer that can specific specifically bind to caffeine molecules and then chemically attach these polymers um, to the cellulose fibers that are found in uh, paper pulp. Uh, and also, in order to increase the biodegradability, our polymers are partly made from cellulose nanocrystals, uh, which are the crystalline portions of cellulose fibers. Um, and also, this will provide um, um, better mechanical strength in our filters and increase the integrity of the structure. <laughs> Uh, so we begin the synthesis of our molecular imprinted polymers by chemically modifying the surface hydroxyl groups on uh, CNC, or cellulose nanocrystals. Um, uh, and we modify them using malic anhydride, which will introduce malic acid groups that have a vinyl group, which can serve as the uh, as serve as like an initi initiation site for the graft polymerization of, of our monomer, uh, methacrylic acid. Um, so, 
so in this synthesis, uh, the caffeine serves as the template molecule, um, which will form a complex with the functional monomer, which is uh, methylcholic acid. And the polymerization will occur on the surface of cellulose nanocrystals. Um, so first we mix the caffeine template and the methylcholic acid monomer, and they will form a stable complex by hydrogen bonding. After that, we add a crosslinker EDGMA, and we initialize the polymerization using AIBN. Um, so if you, you can imagine, like the polymerization, the methylcholic acid will start polymerizing on the surface of the cellulose nanocrystals, forming like a brush-like structure. And the crosslinkers, the EDGMA, will form like the um, like the bridges across the different chains and forming like a polymer resin, uh, which will encapsulate the ca uh, caffeine template molecules. So uh, after the polymerization, they will form like these binding pockets uh, of caffeine. And when we remove the uh, caffeine template molecule using uh, methanol and citric uh, acetic acid, they will leave behind these uh, small binding sites that are specific for caffeine only and no other molecules. And in order to incorporate um, this polymer into a filter paper, uh, first uh, we obtain a polymer resin, which is just like a solid block of polymer, and we grind that up into uh, micro microspheres. And then because uh, our polymers have cellulose nanocrystals in them, we can uh, chemically conjugate the cellulose nanocrystals in our polymer with the cellulose fibers in pulp using citric acid as a crosslinker. And this will uh, make sure that the polymer is stable in our filter, pa filter paper and it won't leach out um, when it's being used. And so some of, um, and so some of the design trade-offs that we consider is uh, first, uh, we optimize the binding capacity of our polymer uh, by changing the amount of um, of, uh, of our monomers, um, and, also, and also balancing that with the biodegradability because obviously um, like polymethylacrylic acid is less biodegradable than cellulose. Uh, secondly, um, uh, the amount of polymers that we add to our filter has to be balanced with the cost. Uh, so we'll, like, well, if we add more filters to our, to our uh, if we add more polymers to our filter, it will obviously uh, have better performance, but that will also increase the cost. And lastly, the balance between the polymers and filter amount in our filters uh, will also have to be cons uh, considered with the filtration rate to have the opt optimum flow rate for liquids to pass through the filters. Um, and now Matthew will explain some of the results of our design implementation. So to test our concept, we really need to do four things. We first have to make sure that the maleic and hydride reaction is successful. And this we chose to do FTIR and titration. Then we have, to, um, we have to make sure that our polymer system is functioning as what we claim it to be. So the purpose of the CNC maleic and hydride is to increase the temperature resistance of the paper. So to test this, after we've made our, pol after we've made our polymer, we use TGA. And then we use UV vis after to test the specificity and the rebinding of caffeine towards uh, the polymer. Um, and then next, we do a bunch of physical tests on our filter papers that we make to test its tensile stress, its flow rate, and compare this to um, current existing papers. Next slide. So FTIR, uh, we have four samples. First one is CNC maleic and hydride reacted without a base. Um, the second one is the sample we want to focus on that's reacted with a base. The base is diisopropyl amine, and what it does is it helps catalyze the reaction. Second one, uh, third one is just pure CNC. Last one is maleic and hydride. So this, what you're looking for is the presence of C double bond stretching signal in FTIR, and that is usually found at 1680 to 1640 nanometers. So considering the second sample, you see that region, you see that uh, plateau region around 1680. That corresponds to our vinyl um, stretching signal. And comparing this to the negative controls, i.e. the first one and the third one, that is without base, you don't see that signal. So that proves that we have, um, that our reaction has proceeded. However, the peak there you see is really small. So next, so because it's small, we really want to quantify the rate of the reaction. And we did this using titration. So here you progressively add um, hydroxyl groups to the solution, you make it more basic. And you see, and by looking at the change of the pH, you can determine how many carboxylic acid groups are modified onto your CNC. And from this procedure, we find that we only get 7% modification. That seems a little bad, but it's not that bad, because, um, 
only one of the hydroxyls on CSC is accessible for the reaction. So 7% is not that bad, I slide. Uh, so now we have determined that we've successfully modified our CNC with malic, with malic and hydride, and we do the polymerization. And what, now, what you have now is MAA polymerized onto CNC. So the whole point of using um, malic acid CNC is to increase the structural rigidity of our polymer system. So to demonstrate that this is true, we use TGA, and we compare this to a negative control where we don't do the malic and hydride CNC polymerize. Um, modification process. And from this result, we find that our modified CNC, the one we made, it has a 15 degree higher vaporization point than uh, unmodified CNC. So what this means is it demonstrates that what we want to do is like we've achieved what we want to do. And the 15% may seem really small, but that's probably because of the 7% modification. Furthermore, uh, the blue curve represents the derivative of the weight percent as a function of the temperature. For the bottom plot, the second plot, you see two peaks for this, as opposed to the first, as opposed to one peak for the first. The two peaks correspond to, of course, the, poly, uh, the poly MAA and the CNC separately, whereas the second peak, we know that it's covalently bonded. So we know how it's bonded. Now we want to test the pocket specificity. So to do this, uh, we have polymer in solution. We add in caffeine at a known concentration. Uh, we let it stir for a set amount of time, and we take out all of aliquots at certain times. And we measure the caffeine concentration. And we find that after 10 minutes, our polymer absorbs 50% of the caffeine, which is, which is pretty good for, I don't know, a few months. And then we have, um, and we have two controls that we do on top of this. We have our control polymer, which doesn't have uh, binding pockets, and we tested it with vanilla. So of course, if it doesn't have binding pockets, it's not going to bind, which is what you see there. And with vanilla, you see a tiny bit of binding, but that's due to non-specificity, the polymer. Next slide. Uh, so after we've demonstrated that our, our polymer is capable of binding caffeine, we embed it into a sheet of paper. Here we just grind it up, mix it with hardwood pulp. Uh, top left is blank filter. Uh, right is with control polymer. Second, um, bottom left is with no citrate reacted with filter paper. So there's no covalent bonds between the two. And the second one is with a citrate reaction. So now we have covalent bonds between our polymer and our paper to embed it. And with this, we did a few um, physical characterizations of it. We looked at the tensile strength. We find that our, uh, both of the filters we made is stronger than a regular coffee filter. This is uh, probably due to the fiber count we were using. We don't know. Um, what the fiber density is in the regular coffee paper we were using. Degradation temperature is higher. And the flow rate for the first and third one are comparable, which is what we want, because man wants to wait the same amount of time for his coffee. However, you find a higher flow rate for the second one. And that's because we're not treating it with citric acid, so the polymer falls off, because you don't have those covalent bonds. So that's why the flow rate is higher. That's right. So some future considerations. Uh, so one prototype costs 24 cents. It is four times cheaper than if you were to buy a pure drink pod from Tim's. Uh, the market's huge, kind of. It's $4 billion, uh, which encompasses 10% of the coffee consumption in Canada. And yeah, there's millions of users. Target investors include anyone that makes coffee, such as Tim, Starbucks, that's that. And future recommendations. So we would like to optimize the flow rate while maintaining caffeine specificity. That is, the faster you pump it through, the less time it'll interact with the polymer and the less will bind. Uh, we want to adjust the density of the polymer in the filter paper. And we want to control its distribution in the paper, too. And we want to adapt filter. Uh, we want to adapt our polymer to other kinds of beverages. So in conclusion, we meet our customer requirements. So filtration rate is 50%. I think that's, that is what we set out to do. Uh, it's compatible with existing coffee. Uh, coffee brewers. I mean, we shape the paper. So we can shape the paper uh, such that it fits into any coffee brewer we want. It's low cost and it's safe. Uh, thank you to Dr. Tan, who is in Singapore right now. Uh, lab instructors, Howard Sue and Neil, and the administration. Oh, it's uh, UV-Vis. It has an absorption at 274. 
take aliquots, measure that, and we know the molar extinction coefficient, and we just do the calculation. Yes. Which concentrations of caffeine did you test? We're using, I think, one millimolar? Yeah, we tested one millimolar, which is around the same concentration as caffeine in coffee. Overall, the amount of caffeine you want binding to your polymers depends on how much you use in the polymerization. Because that controls how, much, how many pockets you have, right? So if we, if we wanted more, then we'd use more in the polymerization. Yeah. So, so you have a, a lot of different stuff in the molecule. Yes. You also have a, a start with positive charge. Then we will remove all this and then you want to calculate the system. How do you select the molecule? So it's by, it's by electrostatic, like the pocket. It's sterically interacts, and it's electrostatically interacts. So we demonstrated with the control with vanillin, and we showed that it doesn't bind vanillin. If you know if you know its structure, it doesn't. I know it doesn't look exactly the same. Yeah. Nope. Yeah. yeah. So. So. Yeah. So we were thinking of using adenosine, which is the. Um, it's like it's. Caffeine binds to the adenosine receptors in your brain. Adenosine also looks identical to it. It's just missing the three methyl groups. However, uh, we didn't have adenosine around, and it's really expensive. But, but how much caffeine costs? Ca caffeine's like half a kilo is like $30 or something. Adenosine, because people use it for PCR. So it's really expensive. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, otherwise, uh, thank you very much.